It sounds like the story of a soap opera. The younger son of a millionaire feels like his father's estate is interrupting his lifestyle. So he decides he's going to leave home and live wild and free. But he needs his father's fortune to bankroll his lifestyle. So he goes to his father, demands his part of his inheritance, and then tells his dad to drop dead and heads off to live in a distant country. Jesus told this story to a group of dinner guests about 2,000 years ago. It's recorded in Luke chapter 15. It's the story of a man with two sons, and each of his sons represents a different way of relating to God. The younger son, the one who wanted his inheritance early and who left his father's home, represents life from God. Let me illustrate it to you this way. The younger son wasn't interested in having a relationship with his father. All he cared about was what he could get from his father. In this case, the father's wealth. In a word, we would say that this younger son was a jerk. A great many people relate to God in a similar way. They're not interested in a relationship with God. They're more focused on what they can get from God. Now, this isn't entirely bad or wrong. Jesus does tell us that we are to expect things from God. He is our provider and we should ask him for what we need. But the problem with life from God is this is all it sees him as. All it views God as is the one who gives us what we need, want, or desire. And this is all predicated on a certain view of the universe. Imagine this apple represents the universe. Life from God says that if you were to cut open the cosmos past all the layers of time and matter, at its core what you would find is yourself. This view says that you, with your desires, are the center of the universe. This message is really appealing to people today because our consumer culture sends the very same message. Consumerism says that the consumer, with his unmet desires, that would be you, are the center of everything. And everything and everyone's value is determined by how well they satisfy your desires. Is a spouse valuable? Well, as long as she meets my desires. When she stops, I'm justified in trading her in for a new one, just like a car, or a shirt, or a new computer. The same thing is true for God. He has no inherent value except what he can do for me. And if one religion isn't working out, well, I might as well try another. A lot of popular Christianity is built on this same premise. We tell people, if you just come to Jesus, he'll fix your problems. He'll make your marriage better. He'll get you that job you want. A friend of mine likes to say that we treat Jesus like he's the duct tape WD-40 combo pack. All you need to fix just about anything. But this isn't really Christianity because it isn't about a relationship with God. It's more interested in what we can get from God rather than a life with him. Like I said, it's not Christianity. This is Christian consumerism. So then what's the solution? Well, unfortunately, the solution provided by most faith communities is just as flawed as the problem. In the story that Jesus told about the man with two sons, it wasn't just the younger son who was a jerk. As it turns out, the man's older son was just as lost as his younger brother. In the story, the older son was the good one. He always served his father. In fact, he makes a big deal about how he has never disobeyed any of his father's commands. Rather than just taking from his father, like the younger son, the older son lived for his father. This is what many faith communities advocate in response to Christian consumerism. Rather than seeking to live life from God, we should instead seek to live our lives for God. Remember that cosmic apple I drew earlier? Life from God said that you are the center of the universe. Life for God recognizes that this is wrong. Instead, the life for God posture says that the center of the universe is mission, God's mission, and life is all about participating in it. It's all about doing good things for God and his kingdom. So rather than making us into Christian consumers, the life for God wants to make us into Christian activists. And rather than judging everything and everyone in relation to me, now everything is judged in relation to the mission. A person is either on mission, supporting mission, hindering mission, the object of the mission, or a lazy Christian who should be on the mission. Mission becomes everything. So what could possibly be wrong with this? We are called to live our lives for God, right? Well, the problem is, just like in the previous posture, when it becomes the entirety of how we view our relationship to God. The person who's living for God may be just as lost and in no better position than the person living selfishly from God. Whether we're living from God or for God, the focus of our faith is upon what we're getting or what we're giving, but it's not actually on God himself. In a different way, the older son in Jesus' story was just as lost as his younger brother. He wasn't focused on what he could get from his father, but he was entirely focused on what he could do for his father, and he was fixated on the kind of reward he would get for his obedience. 
At the end of Jesus' parable, we find something remarkable. The father finally speaks to his older son and reveals to him what's really most important. The father says, all these years you have been with me and all I have is yours. But this brother of yours was lost and is found again, was dead and is now alive. What mattered most to the father was not the younger son's disobedience or the older son's service. What mattered most to him was their presence. He wanted to be with them. And the same is true of our Heavenly Father. This is what both life from God and for God fail to grasp, that what matters most is not our disobedience or our service, but our presence, our life with God.